My name is Jason. My name is Tom. And this is Fear of a Black Dragon, an old school RPG podcast. And in this episode, we turn aside into that ominous tract which, all agree, hides a tower darkly. Our first segment is the basic crawl. A Tower Darkly is an 18-page adventure for the Bastards system. It was created by John Davis. The adventure presents a small hex crawl in a land called Schwarzmoor, the central feature of which is a tower in the southerly portion of that hex crawl. The module begins with a numbered diagram representing the tower, plus a table of loot and spoor, the latter of which is detritus found in the tower. I had to look it up. Next comes a list of adventure hooks. This is followed by a hex map and short descriptions of what can be found in each hex, including the village of Raston, where the story presumably begins, Gallows Hill, where some alleged witches have been hung, some clear-cut wastes, Carmen Rot House, where a local duke is currently camped, the Sparrow Camp, a group of mercenaries in the employ of the aforementioned duke's brother, the Seat of Schwartz, which is a tower darkly where that brother is hiding out, an isolated witch's hut, and Butcher's Bay, where some pirates are. Finally, and this is in fact the bulk of the module, comes a section of key locations for the tower that the module gets its name from. So, our bona fides, Tom. Right, I have run a family-friendly one-shot of this using my local game that I call Indomitable Gauls. So if you imagine Asterix-style adventures, it's kind of like that. How about you? I ran a two-shot uh, using Trophy Gold, though I will say that in order to get two sessions out of it, because it's kind of a short module, I had to fill in quite a lot of detail with Trophy Loom. Things we liked about A Tower Darkly. It's probably worth emphasizing that this module is really short. Those 18 pages are pretty lightly filled. It's much more stylized than just like packed with text. Mm -hmm. That's not a knock on it at all, but I think it's worth saying because it is considerably shorter than something we have normally covered on this show, and it does kind of figure into the conversation, especially the expert delve. So I want to just kind of put that out there first. But in terms of things we liked, why don't we start with visual design stuff? It's got a lovely, what's the word? They're not gothic fonts, but they're getting close to it, aren't they? And it has this purple right, and green yeah. accent color scheme. So don't worry, reader, it's mostly black on white text, but it has all the illustrations are the Joker palette and contrast is brought out that way which is nice and it helps you to navigate everything even though it's a little package but it's a nicely organized little package of, of an adventure for sure and the images i think are nicely chosen and unified by that color scheme i agree the use of purple and green throughout is uh, it's very pleasing to look at because they're contrasting colors and so i really enjoyed that you mentioned the artwork most of the artwork, I'm pretty sure, is public domain. I think some of it might be original, but I wasn't quite I sure. Think, there I are think no credits. all of it probably is. I see Goya, uh, and there, the ghoul is illustrated by Sassen, yeah, that's, that's Sassen one of the devouring his, his... The cover art, I'm not sure if that's mm. public domain or not. I wasn't 100% sure. In any case, it's neither here nor there, because it actually works really nicely here. And I think it's because of that purple and green color scheme. The trick with public domain art is making it feel like an original part of the product making it feel like unified because frequently you're dealing with different art styles and stuff you know and then you're putting it in this creation that it was not originally intended for and i think that the creators basically just layering over purple or green in the right places over the public domain art does a nice job of like unifying it into the whole which i think is pretty clever yeah it's really fair too i mean looking at that satin painting it's fun because you recognize it you're like oh isn't that hey that's that thing but it doesn't feel like it's just grabbed and stolen it's like it does depict the monster in the tower mm -hmm. but it's also uh the goya painting which is, is pretty cool i think yeah i think overall just the module has it has a nice, truly DIY charm to it. Um, and again, that's not a knock. I think that a lot of products lately want to have the feel of DIY without being DIY, or like they're actually like really highly produced things, but they want to feel like handmade. This one actually like feels really authentically that. <laughs> yeah, so. it's sort of handmade, but with careful choices made about the ingredients or the, the components, I suppose you could say, which I think yeah, is... Yeah, yeah. Is the, it, it almost felt okay. like, and I, I don't know anything about the creator apart from just the little bit that I've communicated with them on Twitter, but it almost feels like 
taking your sort of limited resources and maximizing it, yeah. which I think is pretty great. Okay, so that's the visual design stuff. Let's talk about the content of the module. My comments here are pretty general. I know you have some more specific ones. So I'll just say that, you know, even though the text is short, it has an unmistakable mood. This is a grimy, bleak little affair. I mean, if you're looking for a decadent, noble, grand guignol type horror story, this is a good place to look. You've got dead kids, questionable food, mad gibbering nobles, liches. It's it's hitting a lot of really interesting themes in terms of darkness, almost like a Poe quality in a way, or a sort of Roger Corman film sort of thing kind of going on. What do you think about just sort of generally the, the vibe? Yeah, I, th- I think it's great. And it's so effectively done. One of the things I like about this is it, it's not over explained. You get given the tower map in the form of numbered boxes that are like a schematic map, but it doesn't tell you that's what it is anywhere. You just you're expected to figure that out because you just bought a mini module called a tower darkly. And actually, because the front cover, the white part, which is representing the tower, matches the shape of the white lettering on the diagram. And there's loads of stuff like that, including that goes through to the the mood of things. There's no overwrought description of too much. In fact, one of the most effective things is these two double page spreads that are some desolate looking landscape artwork. Each page in those spreads has a phrase describing the tower basically yes one just a finger of death and like that's all you need in fact if you were to kind of take the components and describe them more prosaically at the same length they might not feel as gloomy and uh grand guignol and, and so on as they do but they do so it's a really nice little package of evocative imagery that's being carefully chosen and words carefully chosen as well to tell you the story like even some of the locations there's a place called the clear cut waste and you can figure out from reading that and a mention in another area that all it used to be full of trees and now it's not that's why it's clear cut but at no point does it actually say in that one line description all the trees have been chopped down you you kind of get there you get there yourself which is cool yeah yeah yeah. yeah. and this plays into the expert delve quite a lot i like what you said about the module having carefully chosen words that is really important here we've done 80 plus episodes now of this show And something I find that is a regular theme when we're looking at these modules, especially when we look at the sort of historical sweep of these modules, is it's almost like a tension between the module giving you too much information and the module being not too sparse, but maybe a little too cute by half, (laughs) you know, in terms of what like GMs need to actually use and play. And I think that has a lot to do with the time period when the module was produced. I think it has a lot to do with the design movement that it came out of or the particular aesthetic or what have you. This is a really interesting example to me. This Tower Darkly module is an interesting example of what is just a glimpse, a very short module. But when you get into the details, when you look at the words, everything feels like just so. Mm. And that just so-ness, that like well-chosen turn of phrase, things placed where they are on the page, the little like quote things and the two-page mood spreads, it does what it needs to do to get your head in the right space. Like you are there, you're locked in, and you can kind of do the rest as the GM and the play group. It's an interesting philosophy. I don't think it's necessarily better than like a module that's much more detailed. And I don't think it's necessarily any worse. I do think it's a different approach and I think it's interesting. Sure. Okay. So other things you liked. Yeah. As you said, there are a few details that I quite like. Uh, Let me see. Let's start at the beginning. There are four possible adventure hooks presented to you on one page. And uh, I'm not going to quote them because of course in a, in a module this small, I feel like we could easily spoil large amounts or rather give away large amounts. We probably could have read the whole thing by now. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, So, um, (laughs) Yeah, to, to be honest, why is anyone listening to this? Po- okay, no, let's let's not dwell on that. Let's move on. Dude. There are four adventure hooks, and what I like about them is they're all quite different, but they are compatible. All four of these could be the motivation for the party at the same time. Mm-hmm. They could have arrived in this one place, be working for these two sets of people, and fourthly, have got lost or whatever that last happenstance one is. I think that's really clever because then you can just pick and choose like one, yeah. some, or all of these are your hooks. That's great. There's a trap in one room in the tower. And what I like about it is it splits the party if someone falls it. Okay, spoiler, it's a pit trap. The, <laughs> if someone falls in, it doesn't just split the party between the quite boring one of you is in a pit trap, everyone else isn't in a pit trap. It splits you between two actually properly featured locations in the dungeon, which is good. 
because that one person mm -hmm. who's split off can do that classic thing that now I have thought about it and run this module. You actually see a lot in kind of caving movies and things like, mm -hmm. no, it's okay, guys. I'll see if I can find a way out down here. Yeah, right, yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's really cool. I, I really like it. It's so simple and yet effective. What else? There's a, well, all right, spoiler alert. Down in that tomb is a lurking wizard who is actually neither dead nor alive, but astrally projecting or something. And oh, I, yeah. I think I presented it as a lich in my Yes, I think in he says it's a lich, it. actually. Yeah, it's yeah, a, it's a, yeah, yeah. And I think this resting ancient thing that's unrelated to the bad guy... See, I don't want to call the Duke of Schwartz a villain, because he's actually a bit of a coward and a pathetic rogue. He is, he's, not, yeah. he's not a full-on proper villain. But the inclusion of this, I think, who's unrelated to that bad guy Duke and what's going on, and is just a more ancient thing, like a more cosmic level thing, I think it actually pushes this from very nicely done to really rather good right it takes it, it to just, another level doesn't yeah, it it does yeah it really like, does and it doesn't even have to factor into the adventure that much it's just the inclusion of that mm -hmm. something extra at the edge that i think really helps to yeah underscore the sense of wonder and foreboding and everything it's that you want it's super great. clever choice by the creator there's a sort of jaded or eye rolly way of like just skimming and reading this module and thinking, oh, they threw a lich in there because D&D, okay. But that's really not what's going on here. Like, you're right. The inclusion of it actually feels really, when it shows up in play, it actually takes the story to a different level. What became a grimy, bleak little like, well, in my case, the way I ran it, a missing kid scenario, that was the hook I used. I actually combined the hooks, speaking of the hooks, which was also fun to do. Mm -hmm. But rather than just being like very low magic level grim little blasted landscape village crawl or whatever it kind of took it to this other place that i don't think the players saw coming yeah it was really neat and you're right it kind of adds this element of the cosmic and the supernatural in a way that is just right i liked it quite a lot this is i'm getting very philosophical today and maybe that's the purpose of the show i don't know but we have often said on this show that I can't remember whose quote this is, but we've quoted them before in saying that you should take the monster manual at face value. The monster manual is, if you take it at face value, it's scary. Right. right. This is one of those cases where it's a clever use of the monster manual. Let's take this monster, a lich, which we all know, and which has the potential of possibly feeling a little old hat, and use it in this really careful way that actually elevates and emphasizes the horror of the lich. Yeah, nice. And well, just to swing from the cosmic to the, to the prosaic, the other thing I like here is the inclusion of the castle's privy as a fairly major <laughs> plot point. Like, uh, there's lots of, there's a, I mean, there's not a lot, there's like two separate bits basically about the possibility of climbing up through it to get to the top of the mm -hmm. tower and uh, of the bad guy trying to flee down it and one reason i particularly like this is just uh, from synchronicity a friend of mine recently visited some castles in england and upon his return noted uh, in a chat on discord well I i'll quote him actually uh, he said there are latrines everywhere in these things i counted at least 15 <laughs> in bodiam and yet they always seem to be missing from rpg maps and video games don't forget the privy in your next old school castle crawl and as if by magic here we are privy tastic well we so, had a privy trap like three episodes ago too that's right? true actually yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Although, um yeah clearly it's the mark of a strong module <laughs> It's, uh, <laughs> oh, it's right, because right, yeah. the last one we really, really loved a lot was yeah. the ghost, the mansion one, and that had a privy <laughs> so, trap. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Let's move on to questions we had. I just have one. Yeah. And I think it's our only question today. You noted that you ran a, a family friendly version of A Tower Darkly. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear what that was like. Oh, sure. I mean, it's not, <laughs> it's not, not as difficult as it sounds. I mean, if you, yeah, read the, the booklet you would think well there's no way this works but i would say it required three major changes one is just to present the child abduction as a sort of pied piper of hamelin type scenario mm -hmm. which is is horrific if you think about it but if you're a parent the children seem to be remarkably sanguine about this kind of thing secondly uh, the poisoned to death people are instead merely given a magic potion that will make them sleep for 100 years or whatever. Oh, good. Um, okay, basically like use that. grim fairy tales, all this stuff. And similarly, with the uh, ghoul who has eaten all the children already, I was wondering, I was thinking, oh, how, do I, how do I do this? And then it occurred to me, again, just go for that slightly sanitized version of fairy tales where, you know, in a lot of endings of Red Riding Hood, the woodcutter comes along and just chops the wolf's belly open and Grandma right. and Red Riding Hood pop out. Yeah. A similar thing, no troll death here, but if he could be 
given something else to fill his stomach, then he would just bloop, gloop up just all the kids, the kids who he was who he was kind of <laughs> sick of because he'd swallowed them whole and they were fidgeting around in his stomach and uh, annoying him. So, yeah. so then, you know, our, our little hero went upstairs to the kitchen, avoiding the flying the trap there. He said, try not to do too many spoilers, made a cake and some sandwiches and then came back down. So <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it still had a lot of that spooky stuff and finding things fascinating like going to the gallery and, and trying to figure out what what had happened and, and trying to figure out where the bad guy was but without too much gore or too too many things that are disturbing and actually the advantage that i've only recently realized about using asterix as a model for these is that compared to like if you were to try and do a bare knuckle kung fu thing where you have to reskin all the bad guys as also being unarmed uh, if you think about asterix the romans are always coming after him with spears but he just glugs some magic potion and decks them. So mm. like, mm. and then when your characters, your PCs are doing that, it's all very wholesome, a little bit violent, but not as bad as actually stabbing people to death with uh, sharp sticks. So yeah, the whole thing, I've only recently started trying it, but I recommend it as a sort of youngish to maybe early high school age group method just to, yeah, mm. get, a, get a bit of the old ultra violence, but not, not too much. Yeah. yeah, it might be a good expert help topic in the future, maybe actually. Maybe one day, yeah. Might not one that I would personally be helpful with, but I'd be happy to nod. Uh, <laughs> sure, we can force you to, to read a few Asterix books and get yeah, it. Well, well, you would have to because I th- that, that is not a thing over here, right? Like, we no, don't have no, Asterix no. in the States. It's, it's a, not a, it's a shame. Like, I promise you, our American listeners are like, half of them are probably like, what? <laughs> okay, all right, moving on. The Chain Lightning Round. Tom. I like the German language color coding in the names of the brothers' domains. We have Schwarz for black and Carmen Root, Carmine Red. Hmm. One of the hooks involves paying a visit to the Duke Schwartz because, quote, his tithes are late, a heresy most foul. The witch in the clear cut wastes lives in what used to be an isolated hut in the woods, but now can be easily spotted from the road. <laughs> I like the detail that, speaking of the privies, that one of the privies can be easily scaled to access another area, but, quote, not with armor on. I don't know, just they're really (laughs) well-chosen words. Yes. And uh, just quoting from the map legend, the hex map, any hex not filled in is barren moors and blasted heath. As noted before, the module does feature a lich. This lich in particular is submerged in a bunch of green ooze, which 100% tapped into my Masters of the Universe nostalgia. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's uh, Skeletor being a very famous lich, by the way. Yeah. Let's go to the expert delve. You can now get Hearts of Ulin Worlds on Drive Through RPG. This supplement for Hearts of Ulin includes alternate settings, and new mechanics. In it, you'll find Shadow of the Joseon, a historical Korean setting, 1905 San Francisco, Chinatown in the shadow of the Chinese Exclusion Act, Cor de la Epée, a fantastic swashbuckling France, Academy of the Blade, an anime-inspired dueling school, Fight Me IRL, a cyberpunk corporatized future, and Silk and Steam, a silk punk fantasy setting. As well, Hearts of Wulin Worlds contains a new core playbook, detailed options for running Wuxia Mysteries, and more. You can get the PDF, as well as the core Hearts of Wulin book, at our drive through publisher site, bit.ly forward slash gauntlet hyphen publishing. It's the Expert Delve. Today's topic is Unearthing the Implied Story. Now, A Tower Darkly is a very light module, and only one section of the hex crawl, the tower, is given any detail at all. If you plan on running it for more than a session like I did, or exploring anything outside the tower, you're going to need to flesh it out a bit. And something I've discovered in running so many of these modules, and especially adapting them to my system of choice, or the amount of game sessions I have available to me, is that I have to find the implied story of the module. We're going to talk about unearthing that implied story, different approaches, different strategies, a little bit of philosophy talk in terms of design. And so, yeah, finding the story beneath the story, I think, is really interesting. And I think it's worth noting here that when I say implied story, at least, I don't necessarily mean 
a story the module creator intended but just forgot to tell us about <laughs> though it can definitely right. be that, that sometimes that could yeah that could yeah, be it, yeah it can definitely be that but also the sort of story that we come up with at the table or in our gm prep based on what's already there so that's really the crux of what we're talking about here is based off what's there kind of finding more of the story underneath it i will say that in the case of a tower darkly i do think that there is a definite story underneath it the author intentionally did not tell us and has in fact chosen to sh- to frame things and position things and say things in a certain way to where we're meant to sort of draw it out ourselves yeah that's right it's uh it's done that way instead of so you don't have to read the backstory and remember it. You right. just it comes to you as as you read each section. Precisely, yes. It feels like an intentional choice. Yeah, and actually, that's what makes it a great module for this topic, right? So um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's, let's talk about it. Okay, let's talk about big picture ideas here. Kick us off with some of that stuff, Tom. I'd like to add that this is sort of interesting in a RPG historical way, in a way as well. There is in existence a strand of OSR bloggery and and theory from. So recent history, I guess, but within the last decade or so now, called D&D is Always Right. And the origin of this is from a blog post by James Malasevsky. I cannot remember when I read it to get this quote I'm about to read to you today, but I failed to note the date because that's the kind of prep I do. Um, He writes this, which I think will sum it up better than I can. So he says, the D&D is Always Right principle means that many times you're left wrestling with things that simply don't make sense or at least whose meaning is obscure. There are two ways to resolve the confusion. The simplest one is simply to assume that the original text must be quote-unquote wrong, which is to say that the author had no idea what he was talking about, and you can safely substitute your own preference in their place. The more difficult approach is to step back and assume the author actually intended something, and that, simply because that something isn't immediately obvious, it isn't any less real. Bit of an ellipsis here to skip to another part I want to quote. That's the fun of role-playing, and that's the fun of D&D. Finding ways to make all this crazy stuff fit together just enough so that I can enjoy the game without having my suspension of disbelief ruined. Now, this is slightly different from the topic we're talking about in a way because it's sort of deliberately taking things that seem to be challenging or odd or, like, unintuitive. Like, why are there so many elf priests on the random encounter table riding griffins and that kind of thing? Right, yeah. what, does that, what does that mean about the economy? So it's not really that. Uh, end of things but i think in spirit it's very similar this idea of accepting things as they are and not just writing them off yeah it's it's kind of funny because i don't know why i'm like dwelling in history today but i am hmm. so i came in in second edition D that was my sort of entree into the hobby and i never really had much experience with 1e until much later but looking back on it one of the you know as i started looking into 1e modules the one thing that sort of stood out to me vis-a-vis the things that I grew up with, which was 2E, is that my initial thinking was, well, there's no story here. (laughs) You know, like these dungeons are just like series of encounters and encounter tables. And there might be like a basic like adventure hook that gets the characters going, but there isn't like a grand sweep of story here because 2E, that's what 2E was all about, right? 2E was all about big sweeping settings and making everything feel like a living, breathing world and bringing it all together. And so these were two big, like kind of really big differences in terms of how the adventures were presented and even created. And so for me, it's always been a bit of a haul to look at these older modules, especially. And like James says, to believe it, to assume that it's yes. right and to sort yeah. of make yeah. make sense of it. But it's a good skill to have, and I think it's a very engaging and creative process to read a module in a way where you are trying to make connections in what's there on the page and trying to develop story from it, the implied story, like what what I'm calling unearthing the implied story, right? You know, if you came up with Japanese computer role-playing games or like some of these older modules that just seem like very random and counter-based... I think it would be very easy to slip into a mindset of monsters are just there to be fought and killed and none of this has to make any sense, (laughs) right? Like who cares that there's a troll in this chamber and a hill giant in this chamber and, you know, but I think it's satisfying and indeed sometimes necessary. It was, as was the case when I ran this, A Tower Darkly, to go deeper and to kind of figure out what might be there. And so for me, what I do is I try to consider what I call like the sort of story ecology of the module, not just looking at 
who are these characters or what is this place, but specifically asking who are these characters and why are they in this place? And I think once you start to like consider that question, you can start to pull out details that perhaps the author intended for you to find, perhaps not. But in any case, you're going to end up with something that feels coherent with what's been presented. It's interesting and, and uh, a good point that you bring up about the excessively random feeling design in some cases, which I feel like particularly infected the 2E era in d d It would be like, here's the story part. And then here are the random encounters that we're rolling, and they're nothing right. to do with anything. Yeah, but, that is true. Yeah. But random tables, you know, they're not that random. You know, they are. There are different ones in the DMG for different areas of different kinds of countryside. They are designed. They're sometimes badly designed, granted. But hmm. for example, if I can uh, self-indulgently mention my own game, Revolution Comes to the Kingdom, that has a single uh, nested encounter table that you use when you travel from place to place. So essentially, you set your own goals, and then the encounter table is there to kind of get in the way. And it's an overloaded one, so it includes things like weather and uh, local wildlife and stuff. And it's also designed to, the more urban the setting you're in, the, the narrower the encounters are. So, mm -hmm. for example, you might roll a d66, you know, the 2d6, and read one as tens, one as units. By the time you're in the wilderness, that includes everything that's in that set. But you're rolling a, let's say, uh, 100 <laughs> a d106, which is a d10 for the tens, and a d6 for the units in other words the range of possibilities expands you're less likely to run into the local constabulary because you're out in the wilderness or something and it is designed to give players a meaningful choice about the places they go to the types of right. terrain yeah. they engage with frequently a sandbox well ideally sandbox style modules or older random encounter assuming modules like in 1e are also built on that assumption. You know, you decide to go through the desert or back up to level one of the dungeon instead of staying on level three in order to use your pseudo in character, maybe add a character knowledge of the system to understand the ecology of the dungeon. And like you say, part of the GM's job, explicitly or not, is to think about why are there bandits in the woods who mm -hmm. are here? What do they want? Probably they want to rob someone. That's what the reaction table is for as well, you know. Are they feeling friendly? Are they feeling hungry? Mm -hmm. And it's a fun thing to do as well. This is the other <laughs> the other thing that's important about it. It's good prep for your sandbox. It's good daydream prep for those kind of high workload story games you get where you yes. get a prompt and you have right. to think fast. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, but as you say, thinking about who are these people or creatures even? What do they want? Mm -hmm. Why might they be here? And of course, the classic one, as you say, doesn't it seem odd or somehow wrong that they would be here? And if you can figure out a pretty good re reason for that, that's going to be a memorable scene. You know, Absolutely. The time we found the animated corpse of an Egyptian mummy in the town we were going to. What was up with that? I don't, you know, maybe that's happened for some reason on a random roll because you, maybe you're using the wrong table. I don't know. But it's the sort of thing that gets thrown up. And the good thing I would say, though, is you don't have to be watertight in your rationale, right? You can start to present it, have a vague idea of immediately mm. what's happening. But you don't need to nail everything down because the players are there as well, which maybe we'll come back to a bit about the player input. My prep for this segment has been mm. mostly focused on the on the GM side of yeah. things, but I do want to hear, which is weird considering the games I play, but but I do want to hear what you have to say about group input as well. Mm. I want to work through an example. <laughs> I, sure. I think a Tower yeah. Darkly is such a good module for this topic. I've been sitting on this topic, I feel like for a long time, kind of waiting for the right module to come across, and this, mm. is, this is the one. So... If you look at the two dukes, Duke Carmen Rott and Duke Schwartz, we don't know much about them from the text. We know they're brothers. We know Carmen Rott wants to kill Schwartz. And we know Schwartz has kidnapped some kids in the hopes of getting a ransom for them. That's basically all we know. But even if we didn't know those scant details, we could surmise a lot of the story and take it even much further by considering what we do have, and in particular, the position of things in the environment and what things are in the environment. Who are these people? Why are they here? So if you look at the hex crawl map, they are on opposite sides of the map, each in their own tower, despite being brothers, which immediately hints at strife. Just that visual positional yeah. setup like tells you a lot. You can already start inferring things. Schwartz has hired a mercenary company to stand watch outside the tower, again implying a conflict of some sort. You can go further. You can start unspooling more implied story. Schwartz's tower is by a pirate bay, 
implying that perhaps these might be temporary lodgings for him. That he's, you know, maybe he's trying to figure out a way to slip away in case he needs to on a ship. Or perhaps he himself has a history of piracy and smuggling. He's referred to, not given really much reason why, but he's referred to in the module as a blackguard. Maybe that's why, because he's a he's a criminal. And maybe that's why his brother wants to actually stop him. Maybe his brother's trying to bring him to justice. A couple of times we're told that Schwartz's men can be easily paid off. That implies so much about the situation, right? <laughs> Either he's a bad boss, he's literally broke or something, or maybe there's something darker going on. Like he has that lich that he's loosely allied with, or at least having a little truce with. Maybe the lich has done something to the men. Those are all little details about things in the environment, things, their position in the environment, the little tiny details that we have about the characters that you can take that and build a story out of it. And indeed I did. You can draw so much out of it. I think in a way, <laughs> A Tower Darkly is almost too good an example because I think all of this stuff has been very carefully laid out for us right. to, yeah. to find. But you're totally right. This is exactly the implication. There are some sort of looser ones as well, like the reference in the art gallery to the two brothers being pictured in happier times. Right, yes, so, that's but a we, good one. But we never get anything more about that. I think there's also a reference somewhere to the Red Mansion being Kamen Rudd's summer home or something, so implying mm-hmm. that he actually lives further away. Right. Who knows about that? But yeah, exactly. There's lots of these little loose ends that are for you to fill in with your own imagination and decide, at least in the broad strokes, well... Which ones do you find interesting? Which one do you think you need to put more detail or want to put more detail into? And that's exactly it. And then there are sort of these other undercurrents around the island, which are you're given less of, and which I think are way more open to interpretation. Absolutely. Which is mainly that I think about the felled trees is the really evocative image for me. What do you think about that whole? There seems to be a sort of, you've got the two brothers kind of going north to south on the island. And then I sort of imagine cutting across that not really interacting with them directly is the issue of the wood and maybe the pirates as well um yeah the witch the witches at the gallows all that so yeah yeah, uh, so here's the thing you're right the brother's example that's like the easy part that's the one that i think the author had a very clear intention for you to put these pieces together right and find that implied story the middle bits the parts of the hex crawl that are not super detailed that's the tougher part but again this technique and or this way of analyzing the module still serves you well So I managed to spin out a whole story involving the witches and the village of Raston just based off the few things that I knew about the place from from the module. So we do know a few things. We know that Raston is a woodworking or woodcutting community. There's carpenters and things like that, and they also cut down trees. We know that the area around the village is a clear-cut, quote, hellscape. (laughs) We know there are women being hung as witches. Those are the basics that we're given. We are not given any other backstory or motives we just are not given many other details we do know that the woodcutters are in a certain amount of distress about the trees but you're not given like a ton of detail there nevertheless there is a lot of story to unearth so what i did is i created a scenario where this woodworking community couldn't regrow the trees and the reason must be because there are witches cursing the land. And so they start hanging people in an attempt to bring things back to normals. Because we do have this gallows hill where they're hanging witches. And so that was a sort of central feature of the story when I ran it. The Adventure Hook of the Missing Children, in fact, just further fed into this. Because even though the module never says this, you can easily infer that the people of Raston probably think the witches or the women accused of being witches did something to the children. Perhaps as payback or something else. And so that also kind of worked into it. The key thing here, though, is... I was able to look at the full, what I'm calling the ecology of this place, of this module, look at the full kind of spread of things. Who are these people? Where are they at? Why are they where they're at? And what's the environment like? And draw the story out and kind of figure out what the story is going to be. This was handled pretty much from the GM side, though once you get Trophy Gold involved, it kind of spins out even more with player stuff. So maybe we could talk about like player input too. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think... There's two ways that you can kind of do group input. So yeah, sometimes it can be more authorial, as as they say. For example, you might you know there's those mercenaries lurking around outside the tower. You might do the, some of the classic paint the scene questions. Of, what about these mercenaries? Suggest to your character that relationships between red and black have deteriorated a lot, yeah. and the, the answer you'll get from that might give you a clue to some specific event. Like if someone says that the, they see that many of the mercenaries are injured, that might mean there's literally been physical fighting recently, as opposed to just some wary detente uh, or what right, have you. Yeah. And then the sort of more 
character internal level, you can do things that help to describe both the way the character sees the world and also some things about the world. So one that's always stuck with me, I may have mentioned this before, is when I was running Empire in Flames, the Warhammer adventure, the traveling through the wintry mountains at one point. And a thing I got on the random encounter table was a spore kind of result. So it's <laughs> traces of something that's passed. And what had passed was another party of woodsmen or rangers. And I, I was like, what? How would I even explain that? So I just literally said out of character to the guy playing the ranger, you spot this, you spot something that tells you that someone in a similar profession to you has passed by here. But what would that be? He wasn't defining the fact that he'd learnt, but he was telling me how it would appear. Right. And what, yeah. what he came up with was maybe he's like looking for some broken reeds or something. And when I kneel down on the ground to inspect it, I see next to my knee another impression where someone has done exactly the same thing as I've done. And <laughs> right, I thought that right. was just wonderful. The idea that all of these wilderness types have to say, you know, develop the same habits. The same habit. Act, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, that's sort of in terms of that drawing out the details, but also I think it's good for players to do conjecture at the kind of the story level. Absolutely. When they go into yeah. a room, they see mm -hmm. uh, a table set for eight people, seven are dead and one chair is empty. Uh, th they should start to talk amongst them. So, you know, talk, with everyone about what does it mean, come up with the ideas. But my advice would be, firstly, don't get too attached to a theory because what the GM's thought of is probably different. But do let your character get attached to a theory because that's way more fun. Yes, if right. Your character is sure they know what's happened. Yes. And well, and that is almost certainly what John Davis, who created the module, yeah. that's almost certainly what he intended. I mean, that has to be part of the intent in the way things are presented here is that the characters will start to infer things and they will start yeah. to like and, and make the, up the fact, story <laughs> yeah because the fact is that the facts may never come out or need to come right. out in a particular way and i think that's a good way to do the gm side of it actually is to have for example you know you talk about having the your internal system for what the dukes are doing and a separate thing for the witch hangings and, and the wood carpet cutting i think it's good that those don't need to or they probably should never really tie up to each other you shouldn't have it all nailed down Exactly, perfectly, because that's going to be a lot of the temptation then will be to sort of force attention to it in the game. Yeah. To like yeah. really reveal everything. And I don't think you need to do that. I mean, I designed an entire Cthulhu scenario where, <laughs> where there are like three strands of things happening at the same time. And it's all conjecture, right? There's no real, mm -hmm. I have in the back of my head a sort of vague dreamlike sensation of what the answer might be, but I've never written it down or elucidated it to myself. And you can have that kind of thematic feeling that creates a sensation of there being a an answer but everyone could leave the game table with their own version of it in their head and that's one of the beauties of, of rpgs so i i think it would be a mistake to try and peg everything down in real detail because if you're going to do that you could go buy a ad and d 2e adventure which will do it for you <laughs> with box text, for you. So, <laughs> exactly yeah. right that's perfect <laughs> okay i want to end with what we're talking about here is we're engaging a sort of like creative analysis of the module. As we've noted, it's very fun. And I think it's actually something that you can practice in a few easy ways just in your day-to-day -day life. It's something I do. I'm a very like active practitioner of this sort of way of looking at media and looking at things and in particular looking at game modules mm -hmm. in order to sort of draw out the story beneath the story. And so I have a couple of things that I do that you can steal if you wish, listener. The first is that spoil things for yourself <laughs> um, or revisit something that you already know what happens in the end. When you learn what happens in, say, a movie before you watch it, knowing the outcome, you can watch it to see all the ways that the various elements of the production come together to lead to that outcome. This probably sounds horrible, but this is the way I watch movies. <laughs> I, like, I like to know what's going to happen, and then I like to watch them in a way to sort of like analyze them in real time. Why does this character say this? Why are they here? Why did they put this character here? How does this all lead to this? That is something you can do. You can kind of like analyze the media you consume in this way actively as a way of like helping you. It's a skill you can just like bring into other aspects, in particular your GMing. So that's one thing I recommend. Another thing I do, and this is super fucking nerdy and I apologize, is when I'm playing a board game, especially like a fantasy board game, but even like a very abstract strategy board game, I 
tell myself and sometimes the table little stories about what's going on in this otherwise abstract process. Because sometimes there's a story there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should talk about it. So um, <laughs> this is another little thing you can do to find the story in things that maybe may not be there or are not like super overt. That's just a little bit inside my head, I guess. Did you have any other thoughts on on this topic before we leave? Yeah, it? well, it ties in yeah to your advice to to find the story when you're doing this. It's good to use kind of some of the principles of improv, acting, and comedy, which is also about mm, yeah. finding the the story and building it out. And that could be at the table or in that sort of daydreaming stroke prep phase beforehand the key things i would mention are what they call no blocking or what uh, james malasevsky calls dnd is always right so in other words if uh, the module says there is a dwarf mine right underneath the i don't know the kindergarten don't go that's stupid i'm writing it out just you know go with it yeah. build on it yeah so say yes and There's yes and yeah. Yeah, yes and yeah. <laughs> yeah. um and the other one is it's usually good to follow your first instinct and don't try to be quote unquote interesting so this is a a common fallacy that everyone falls into which is where you sort of think this thing jumped to my mind therefore it's obvious therefore it's obvious to everyone hmm. and that's not true so what's obvious to you may be entirely surprising to other people. And even if, um, let's say, 60% of what you think of first is in common with every with someone else at the table, do it five or six times and that overlap gets less and less and less until your contribution is definitely unique. So obviously don't always go with your first idea all the time. Sometimes you'll have bad ideas, but <laughs> you shouldn't reject it just because it seems the obvious thing to do. You will frequently find that people are surprised and delighted by what to you seem like the most pedestrian ideas you've ever had so this is especially uh, the case in a role-playing game we've yeah, talked about this yeah. a million times yeah yeah i think so Bruce. in a role-playing game the easier answer is frequently the better answer because for the precise reason that we do have to get everybody into the same headcanon as best we can yeah, yeah and the simpler answer frequently is more impactful precisely because it's so easy to from a cognitive load standpoint to sort of grab onto it understand it in the story at the same time as you're doing everything else in the game, like managing your character and stuff like that. Yeah, so, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Too, yeah. So, All right. Yeah. Let's move on to the next segment. Okay, it's the companion adventures. I just have one thing, so I'll just say mine now. Okay. I have a music choice, which is Cooksonia, a song by Richard Dawson from the 2021 album Henke, which I believe he made with some Finnish musicians. We've talked about. Richard Dawson in the past. I've recommended him before. Mm. He is a principally the kind of a folk rock artist. One of his albums in particular, Peasant, has a very gloomy medieval feel to it. And I recommend that just in general for especially for getting into the headspace of some of these things we talk about. And this particular song, Cook Sonia, has just has the right vibe for this. Very nice. I have, let's see, a poem to recommend, uh, which is Child Roland to the Dark Tower Came by Robert Browning and to which it's hard to say for sure that this module is alluding to it because almost any story involving uh, people struggling across a blasted wasteland towards a tower are probably influenced by it indirectly or directly. But, you know, it's old, so it's on the internet for free. It's not that long. <laughs> Go read it. And also, I would recommend the uh, Robert Bresson-directed film Lancelot du Lac. Lancelot du Lac? Whatever. The film about Lancelot from 1974. Ah, man, if you like Bleak Nights, this is the film for you. And it's interesting. It's not really like a gloomy color palette or and it's not really gritty in the sense you might think in a sort of gritty reboot modern day movie. It's just that everything everyone's doing is so sort of doomed and kind yeah. of pointless and yeah. just... Uh, I guess I'm really selling this movie, hey. But uh, yeah, that's, that's... <laughs> oh, I'm into it. I, I've never seen it, but I want to now. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... And uh, I and I have one more thing to mention based on the improv is I recommend Play Unsafe by Graham Wormsley, the mm. author of Cthulhu Dark, and that's his book about how improv techniques can change Classic. and improve yeah. your experience of role playing. It's a few years old now, but I. I haven't read it in a few years, but I will assume that its advice is as fresh and applicable as ever. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, what else? Oh, and I just also want to mention some RPG companion things which have previously been on this very podcast. Namely, Behind Closed Doors, I, the previous episode, Winter's Daughter and Scenic Dunsmouth, all of mm -hmm. which I feel have either content or tonal concordances with... They're with swimming in the same stream. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
Fantastic. Well, listeners, that's our show. Fear of a Black Dragon is a production of The Gauntlet. You can find The Gauntlet on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG. We have a website. It's gauntlet-rpg.com. If you'd like to support the show financially, we love that. It's patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jason. Thank you to our implied editor, Rich Rogers. And thank mm. you, listeners, for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>